My name is Guy Christian Agbo. Uh, today is uh, podcast number one, officially. And uh, I have the privilege to, um, um, to have Mr. Tom Carmadon. He is the, CEO, the president and CEO of GFI. GFI is Global uh, Financial Integrity. Now, um, briefly, GFI, it's, um, it's an organization based in Washington, DC. It's a think tank. Uh, it produces high caliber analysis for illicit financial flows, advising developing country uh, governments on effective policy solutions and promoting pragmatic transparency measures in the international financial system as a means uh, to global development and security. You know, every year, trade misinvoicing, this is according to this organization, trade misinvoicing, which is trade fraud, uh, creates a value gap of hundreds of billions of dollars in emerging market and developing countries, which due to massive losses of related duties and value added taxes, the VAT has a corrosive impact on their economies and their ability to reach the 2030, I mean 2030 sustainable development goals. Now, at the beginning, this is a very interesting organization. At the beginning in 2005, Mr. Raymond Baker, an international entrepreneur turned scholar, argued in his book, Capitalism, Achilles Hell, uh, Dirty Money and How to Renew the Free Market System, that illicit financial outflows facilitated by secrecy in the global system, uh, in the global financial system, are bleeding developing countries dry. So Mr. Baker uh, founded Global Financial Integrity in 2006 with the aim of quantifying and studying the flow of illegal money while promoting public policy uh, solution to curtail you know, uh, uh, this issue. In 2008, GFI published its first groundbreaking economic analysis of illicit financial flows, leaving developing countries and has since been recognized by policymakers, academics, and uh, media as an authority on combating financial crime. But today, we have Mr. Tom. Tom is going to represent this organization because for me, this organization is, the, is a very, is so essential, so vital, so important that uh, the information they are providing, their report are so concise that if policy makers uh, have taken the responsibility to, to at least implement what the you know, uh, GFI uh, recommends, you know, that would be a great, of, of a great value for, uh, you know, for, for, for humanity. Now, <clears throat> since then, uh, GFI has been the leader in the policy debates around illicit financial flows, and in particular trade-related issue, uh, illicit financial flows, right? So their work is routinely cited at uh, the high levels by international institutions such as the United Nations, the OECD, and the African Development Bank, and by international figures such as former US Secretary uh, of State Hillary Clinton, and former South African President Tabun Biki, and former UN Secretary uh, uh, General, uh, the late Kofi Annan. Now, for in terms of transparency, uh, I have met Mr. Baker and Mr. Tabun Biki when they came here to New York at the uh, 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 World of Astoria, where I was one of the, the, the only experts from Africa who was uh, privileged enough to attend uh, the meeting. And we had quite exchanged. So I've been quite frankly following what your organization is doing. So Tom, uh, thank you for coming um, to my show today. And how are you? Very well. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I really appreciate that. Good. So now, Tom, let me ask you this. Um, GFI, beside what I've uh, uh, described that GFI does, um, what are the issues that GFI develops? Well, I think if you, you're correct in describing us as a, as a think tank that produces 
uh, reports on illicit financial flows and trade related illicit financial flows in particular. But we also do a number of other things. Right. Uh, we advocate on a global and national basis for more transparency in the global financial system. Okay. Uh, so the, the targets of that advocacy would be organizations like uh, OECD and FATF, mm -hmm. um, uh, and we work with uh, scores and scores of other NGOs around the world mm -hmm. to try to advance various transparency measures, such as uh, automatic exchange of tax information uh, between governments, beneficial ownership registries. We're trying to really uh, get uh, governments to understand how important it is to know who actually owns companies. Yes. Uh, because it's so easy to create, especially in the United States, so easy to create an anonymous shell company mm -hmm. uh, through which all sorts of illicit money, tax evading money, uh, corrupt money, uh, um, money related to illicit activities can be um, laundered and moved and hidden. Right. Uh, it's a real key, uh, key thing we advocate for. The United okay. States, as you may know, is probably one of the worst offenders in the area of allowing anonymous shell companies to be established. Some yeah, 2 million a year yeah. is one yeah. of the estimates. Yeah. We also work very closely with uh, individual governments, um, right. trying to do several things. One, at okay. least, at the very least, get them to recognize the severity of the problem they may have right. uh, in terms of illicit financial flows. Right. But also trying to get them to implement things that uh, will um, help them curtail those flows. So right. there's a lot of thought out there that, well, this is a this is a global problem, so it's going to have a global solution. Well, that's partly right. Right. Uh, there's a lot of things individual governments can do mm -hmm. to begin to try to reduce their illicit financial flows. One right. one of the first things they can do is make trade misinvoicing illegal. You get it right. Uh, it's not illegal everywhere. Right. Uh, so that's the first thing. Get a law in the book. Second is is enforcement. Right. Uh, what what a lot of countries really could benefit from is creating a multi-agency team of government experts from different departments to right. coordinate on information sharing, um, interdiction efforts, those types of things. Right. Uh, a, a team that would be comprised of, say, law enforcement, the customs departments, the f um, finance ministry, the central bank. Uh, mm -hmm. All the money-related organizations Tom, within a Tom, government. Tom, if, if I may, if I may, before we get into the specifics of the issues that uh, GFI is conducting, the report and the recommendation, sure. I'd like you, if you don't mind, to address the issue of a definition, definitional uh, 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 disagreement that uh, most, uh, you know, countries, uh, including the U.S. and the Western world, have have with uh, uh, illicit financial flow definition. As I understand it, right? Illicit financial flow, and I agree with it because I'm writing a book to that effect that comprise, uh, you know, the, the definition that uh, GFI has, which is that illicit financial flow are, are defined as illegal movement of money or capital from one country to another, right? But GFI does also classify this movement as illicit financial flow when funds are illegally earned, transfer, and or utilized across an international border. Okay, we have a bunch of examples on the website, but I'm not going to go into that. But what I want you to address, if you can, please, is that why why, why is the U.S. not supporting just the definition? Because the U.S. fights individually. I mean, like uh, all the little components of illicit financial flow separately. But I don't, I don't understand why they don't accept this definition. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, well, they use the term illicit finance. Right. Uh, Not flows. They leave flows out. Right. Why? Correct. But why, uh, is, why is a lot that? of times, a lot of times the illicit money flows here. Right. Oh, I get it. I get <laughs> it. Flows 
It flows into it. Delaware. It flows into the it. Um, We have such a, as I said earlier, such right. a, a, a large number of anonymous shell companies in this country. It's easy to move money through those companies, through the uh, bank accounts associated with those anonymous shell companies, that, right. that a lot of illicit money flows into the United States and mm -hmm. they don't really want to uh, recognize that that's a problem. Right. Wow. Now, let's go back to the first, one of the most important issues that I see or that I was able to, uh, to curtail on your, on, on your site. Um, we, can, we can start by talking about trade misinvoicing, right? Now, trade misinvoicing, what is the volume? Because I don't even want to start talking about your, your last report. Report dated, uh, I believe, March um, 2000, March 2020, right? Right. Uh, I want to talk about that, uh, the, the, the trade misinvoicing. What's, what is the volume of trade misinvoicing worldwide? Our estimate yes. uh, of, of the most recent year for which we have data, which is 2017, uh, is $817 billion a year. And that's yeah. by uh, developing countries. Uh, that is estimated by looking at the amount of uh, the value gap or the trade misinvoicing amount between developing mm. countries and their advanced economic country partners. Yeah, right. Now, let me ask you this. In your opinion, why is trade misinvoicing used? In other words, oh no, before, sorry. Before we even get to that, could you elaborate? Let's say you and I are speaking to, uh, to a lay person who is not part of what we do, right? But sure. who wants to understand what we are talking about. So could you elaborate to that lay person what is it that we're talking about here, trade misinvoicing? Trade misinvoicing, you, you sort of touched on it in your, in your introduction, and it's right. trade fraud. Right. And, and a little bit more of a description about what trade fraud is, is an importer has to provide an invoice, that's a slip of paper, to the customs department when they import goods. And on that slip of paper is what the goods are, mm -hmm. uh, how many of that particular product are in this container or this packaging, uh, the per unit price for those goods, Mm -hmm. uh, and then the total cost for those goods. So if you have something that's worth $10 each and you have mm -hmm. 10 of them in the package, it's worth $100. So right. uh, that's what they need to provide anytime you import anything into a country. Now, where the fraud comes in, where the misinvoicing comes in, comes in right. is where they would um, falsify the value of the goods. Right. So if the total value of the products coming in should be, the market value should be $100. Right. And they say it's actually $50. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be, not always, it's not an absolute fact, but very often that could be an indication of trade misinvoicing. Right. Or trade fraud. Uh, either, either one is accurate. <laughs> Good. So, so why would they do it? I guess would be the next uh, question. No, well, I mean, I think, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, it's all about greed, right? Because for me, uh, there is no other reason. People will say profit. Well, profit is not profit if it's not legitimate. Correct. When profit is illegitimate, then it becomes greed. I mean, in my opinion, right? So um, uh, let me ask you this. Why, why do you think, um, now, before we get to that, you gave us some numbers concerning the volume, your estimate about the volume of trade misinvoicing worldwide. Uh, does trade misinvoicing impact more developing countries than developed countries like the US? We believe it does because Developing countries have uh, far less ability to absorb the shock of trade misinvoicing, to absorb 
the loss of revenue related to trade misinvoicing. It, it, it happens everywhere. I would never right. say it doesn't happen in developed countries. Of course it does. Right. Uh, but those countries have strong enough economies that can absorb somebody who may be misinvoicing and as a result not paying proper amount of duties or VAT taxes or whatever, what, what mm -hmm. have you. Um, so it does, uh, it does certainly impact developing countries far more than developed countries. Right, 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 right. Now, um, let's, let's stick to, to the trade misinvoicing. Now, in your, uh, on your website, you know, somewhere on your website, you, you know, you define four primary reasons for misinvoicing, for, to, uh, you know, to misinvoice trade, right? You have money laundry. Uh, directly evading tax and custom, as you described earlier, right? Claiming tax incentive. I don't know what volume of that uh, impact countries in general, but uh, you also have what you call uh, capital, uh, no, dodging capital control, if I, if, if I remember clearly. But right. if you could please elaborate on that, uh, you know, you, you'll be very interested. Thank you. On the capital controls? Yeah, I mean, in, on, on, on the four uh, uh, reason, primary reason why uh, uh, there is misinvoice trade. Right, right. Um, uh, the, the money laundering uh, has to do with a previous illegal activity. So right. I'll give you an example. Um, illicit or illegal narcotics are sold in the United States, let's say cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, money is earned from that illegal trade. Um, there has to be some way to get that money back to the producers in Colombia. Right. So, so how do they do that? Well, they take the cash they earn in the United States mm -hmm. and they buy legitimate products. They could buy clothing, they could buy toys, they could buy essentially anything that's a legal product. Right. Uh, and they take those products, those clothes or those toys, and they ship them to Colombia. Right. Uh, and then they can manipulate the price on mm -hmm. the invoice, uh, lower the price, artificially mm -hmm. lower the price. So they evade tax, import tax, the import duty in Colombia. So they save money there. Uh, but they're also laundering the proceeds of the narcotics sale, the cocaine sale. So when the um, uh, recipient in Colombia takes possession of those clothes or those toys. Then they sell those on the open market in Colombia mm -hmm. for Colombian currency. Right. And, and then that money has now been laundered. It Laundered, appears right. to be a legitimate transaction. Transaction, yeah. So this happens all the time with, uh, in, 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 in regards to the United States, um, in regards to um, trade with Mexico and Colombia and Guatemala, any place drugs will have come from, right? Um, this type of money laundering takes place. Right, right, right. Now, what about the claiming? Because you already explained the, uh, the, the, the you know, the way it directly impacts when they do the evading taxes through the custom system. Now, through claiming tax incentive, what is the impact within trade disinvoicing? Uh, the tax incentive uh, yes. reason? Yes. Uh, in certain instances, yes. some governments provide an incentive to a country, uh, to, uh, to companies to export certain goods. Right. Because that brings hard currency into the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and what some companies do is they will export uh, right. a legitimate product, right. but overvalue what the product is worth right. as a way to garner um, uh, tax rebates or tax incentives that right. are greater than the value of the product. So it's another type of uh, trade fraud. It's mm -hmm. just products going out of a country rather than in. Dying, right. uh, and the price being higher than it should be rather than lower than it should be. Lower, so right. you can do, you can misinvoice or you can create trade fraud in any one of those ways, imports or exports and or exports. over or under. Right. right. Okay. 
Now, let's uh, finish on this issue with uh, dodging capital controls. All right, could you elaborate a little bit how that works? Sure. Some countries, uh, because their own currency is so unstable, right, and the exchange rates shift so easily, mm -hmm. they limit the amount of currency that any one person or company can send out of the country. Right. So as a way to evade those controls, some companies will overpay for goods that they import. So to use the earlier example, say a shipment was legitimate, legitimately worth $100, right. they would uh, manipulate the invoice to make it look like it was worth Two hundred dollars. Two hundred dollars. Yeah. And so that they would they they would have a invoice against which they could ship money out of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the one hundred dollars would go to the manufacturer in whatever foreign country the goods came from, and then the additional hundred dollars that they sent to that company could be retransferred to an offshore account somewhere that's in the control of the company in the developing country. Right. So it's just a way of shifting money offshore. Uh, and over time, you can build up a very sizable account balance in an offshore bank account someplace where your own home government has no idea that it's there. They have no way of taxing it. And you have essentially evaded their customs controls. Uh, not their customs, sorry, their currency controls. Controls, right. Okay, now let me ask you this, if I may. Uh, concerning multinational companies, there is an issue of tax avoidance. Now, for me, mm -hmm. I don't believe in tax avoidance, which is, I don't even know why that definition exists. Because it, for me, it is clear tax evasion. Now I understand that people define tax evasion according to what the law says, what the law allows. But on the, on the same, by the same token, I believe that those laws are written by people who want to profit, who want to legitimize, so to speak, their own misdeed, meaning if I want to dodge paying taxes, I will pay lobbyists to write laws that will make uh, tax, uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance. I don't know if you share my opinion on that, but I would like you to elaborate your, the viewpoint of your organization on this issue of tax avoidance with multinational. Yeah, it's, um, it is a, um, it's an issue that, has been debated for quite some time. Should tax avoidance be considered an illicit flow, as is tax evasion? Right. And there's the, the distinction between the two is tax evasion is clearly illegal. Mm -hmm. Tax avoidance is not illegal as far as the law is concerned. It may be illegal from a moral perspective, but it's right. not, illegal from a legal, not illegal from a legal standpoint. Um, so the, the debate now is, should the definition of an illicit flow include tax avoidance or not? Many organizations that we work with, that we partner with, that we're in coalitions with, uh, are very vehemently in favor of broadening the definition of illicit financial flows and including tax, tax avoidance. Division. Yeah, Ta tax avoidance, I'm sorry. Tax avoidance. Yeah. Our okay. view is uh, that at the current time, there is so much opposition by the four main multilateral institutions for broadening the de definition to include avoidance. And those, those institutions are the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, and the OECD. Right. That uh, we are arguing that for the time being, uh, it should be the narrower definition just to be able to get a globally recognized and acceptable definition and then we can move on in future years uh, to begin to try to broaden the definition as we go forward. Because right now, there is no one uh, universally agreed upon definition for illicit financial flows. We identified it, we defined it 
back in 2006 when we started, um, it is generally the definition that most institutions use to this day, the IMF mm -hmm. and the World Bank and others. Uh, but it hasn't been codified in a document as of yet. Right. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's a, uh, you know, very smart people can agree to disagree on this. Um, yeah. uh, but so that's our view of it. Let's get something codified that all governments agree to agree to right now. And then if we can, we can broaden that over time, um, that would be, uh, that would be beneficial, but um, let's get something on paper now. Right, right. I'm with you on that. Uh, trust me, I'm with you on that. Now let's jump, since we've talked a little bit about uh, money laundering, uh, but I would like to go back to uh, uh, anonymous companies, if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, what is the issue with that's this specific problem? Well, I think a lot of people probably remember uh, the Panama Papers scandal from a few years ago. Yes. Massive scandal. Uh, yes. One law firm in Panama uh, had established something like 11,000 anonymous shell companies over numerous years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there are all sorts of sports stars and politicians and very wealthy, well-known, wealthy individuals who had paid this law firm to help them create an anonymous shell company. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that allowed them to do, what an anonymous shell company allowed them to do, was to put money into bank accounts connected with those shell companies mm -hmm. and essentially hide it. Uh, yeah. from from the rev their home revenue authority. So it could right. be taxed. No one knew it was there. Um, and it was a clear example, probably the best we have to this day, mm -hmm. of, of, of the massive amounts of money in bank accounts around the world that are attached to essentially um, uh, secret types of companies. Right. Uh, anonymous makes it just sound private. It's more than private. It's invisible. Law enforcement can't find these things. Uh, um, uh, revenue authorities can't find these things. Or if you can find the name of it, you can't find who owns it. Who owns it, right. Uh, and it's a massive problem, not only for tax evasion purposes, Mm -hmm. But also, you don't, because you don't know who owns it, it could be a terrorist organization. It could be a drug cartel. You have no idea what's going on beyond the veil of just the name. Um, all sorts of illicit activity might be happening. And so these things are really at the crux right. of the global illicit financial flows problem. Until there is a global... Um, rule or international agreements that uh, you cannot have, you cannot control, you cannot create an anonymous shell company. We are going to continue to have uh, an illicit financial flows problem. Right, right, right. Now, let me ask you this. What is the volume of anonymous companies in the U.S.? The standard explanation or estimate we hear is two million a year are created. Wow. Um, it's hard to say, Yeah. but it's massive and it's higher than any other country in the world. Right, right, right. This is sad. This is very sad. Uh, but what can we do? I mean, in other words, before we get to the point where every country is going to agree, is there, you know, anything that uh, people could do in order to eliminate these an, uh, uh, anonymous companies? Well, there's, uh, right now, there's legislation pending in the U.S. Senate that right. would, would um, eliminate the ability of someone to create an anonymous shell company. Mm -hmm. uh, the House of Representatives has already signed the, or passed the legislation, now is right. up to the Senate. To pass the legislation. If they do so, 
Mm -hmm. The White House has already said, the president has already said he will sign the legislation. You mean President uh, Trump? President Trump, the White okay. House, yes, has already said that they will sign this legislation uh, because they understand that beyond tax um, evasion, there's a national security component, as so, I've already uh, yeah. uh, explained. It could be a terrorist yeah. organization that owns these companies or controls these companies. Yeah. Um, so what, you, to, to get to the crux of your question, what can mm -hmm. the individual do? What the individual can communicate with his or her uh, legislator, uh, right. the United States senator or representative, mm -hmm. and begin to talk about the importance of eliminating these anonymous entities. And right. the same right. goes for any country in the world where there's democratic representation. Mm -hmm. Talk to your legislators, talk to the media, uh, talk to advocacy groups, NGO groups that are mm -hmm. focused on this type of issue and mm -hmm. try to create a conversation where one does not now exist mm -hmm. with the hopes that over time, uh, the parliaments or the legislatures in your country will do the right thing right. and create a law against these anonymous companies. Right, okay. Now, just for purposes of, uh, of clarification, the law we're talking about there, that GFI support is called the Incorporation Transparency and Law Enforcement Assistance Act, right? That's correct. Okay, now let me ask you this question concerning Europe. I, I understand that the Parliament, the European Parliament voted in March uh, 2014, uh, something for, you know, to have register or something. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, the European Parliament has and other individual countries. Well, now the, the UK is, is on its way out of the European Union, but, um, the, I'll talk about the, the UK because I know yeah. that example better. Right. They have created something called Companies House. Right. And so this is, this is a public listing of the names of individuals who control companies. They have not only created a situation where the beneficial ownership or the beneficial owners of a company have to be known to law enforcement and the tax authority, Mm -hmm. But it's also a public document. So anybody can go on the website and mm -hmm. begin to do some research, uh, right. find out, you know, what's the name of a person who owns XYZ company. Z company, yeah. Uh, and that's incredible, incredibly important and useful. Unfortunately, the way the U.S. Uh, bill has been written, even if the Senate does pass the legislation and the president does sign it, it wouldn't be a public document. It would only be available to law enforcement and, and the IRS. Um, that's better than nothing. It's important. Um, uh, and we think it will be sufficient to deter people from creating these types of companies. Right. Good. Good. Now, Tom, let's uh, go to tax heaven, you know, bank secrecy and tax heaven, because those are the issues that are so important that your organization uh, 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 um, uh, does the think, the think tank about or the advocacy. Now, the way I see, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Now, most countries that are considered to be tax heaven, right, including the US, right, are countries that are located uh, in the Western world and in the Caribbean, right? I don't understand why African leaders, right, cannot sit down with their Caribbean brothers, right? Because it's clearly an issue of survival for those who are in the Caribbean, right? Or located in, you know, specific, uh, some, some of these tax havens, uh, Bahamas, uh, the, the British Virgin Island, um, <coughs> St. Navy's, yeah, Cayman Island, all these islands. For them, it's an issue of survival. I mean, right. because there is no other substitute way of getting revenues if they get rid of the status of tax haven. So what, is, what are your thoughts? You know, what, are, what are the thoughts of the organization concerning this uh, specific issue of tax haven and bank secrecy? 
Yeah, there's the issue of sovereignty, and these countries will be the first to, to use this argument that we are a sovereign nation, we can make whatever laws we want we to want. make. Right. And if our laws attract money out of your country, well, that's too bad for you, and it's good for us. And well, as you say, for many of these places, mm -hmm. uh, it's a significant um, revenue producer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things we have talked about is 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 what needs to happen uh, is is the IMF I think mm -hmm. perhaps the World Bank as well needs to start conversations with these jurisdictions about how they plan together over time to wean them off of this type of revenue this type of income that's created right. by enabling uh, individuals to manipulate tax laws or evade taxes or create shell companies um, or, or anonymous trusts or fraudulent foundations. Every jurisdiction has sort of has their own specialty. Right. Uh, one will be for tax evasion. One will be for anonymous trusts. One will be for something else, fake foundations, fraudulent foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the international financial institutions, the regional financial institution, uh, the Caribbean Development Bank, say, I think needs to begin a, dis a discussion with these government leaders. Mm -hmm. to say, all right, what these laws you have are a global bad. They are corrosive to so many other places, harmful to so many other places. Let's work together to figure out how over time we can help you, we the, we the um, financial institutions, mm -hmm. and help you develop industries that taken together will replace the revenue you're getting from these laws that allow people to evade tax laws in their home country. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gonna happen overnight, but I know. <laughs> we, also, we also have to recognize the tax havens didn't happen overnight. If you go true. back, you go back 50 years, right. uh, there were just a few of them. Yeah. Now there are dozens. Uh, yeah. And so they have proliferated over time. It's mm -hmm. taken decades. Hopefully it wouldn't take decades to figure out how they could create other revenue streams. Hopefully it could be if a concerted effort was done and aid money provided to these governments to help them bridge yeah. to mm -hmm. those new uh, technologies or those new industries. Um, uh, hopefully it would be f done far quicker than it's taken to build up these um, tax havens over time. So that's how I think they, it could be addressed in a very sort of logical, well thought through planned process. Um, but the underlying understanding is yes, the, some of these laws in a lot of these places are very detrimental to so many governments around the world. Right, right. Right. Now, let me ask you this. Does automatic exchange of financial information, does that work to kind of slow, you know, uh, the process? Does that work? Um, it's unclear if it works yet. Right. Um, the way it's supposed to work is mm -hmm. if I'm in the tax authority, I'm just going to pick some country names out of the air here. Say I'm right. in the tax sure. authority in Ghana. Sure. And mm -hmm. I have a reason to believe one of my, one of the citizens from my country, a Ghanaian, mm -hmm. has, a, has a bank account in the Cayman Islands. Right. Uh, we would, as the tax authority in Ghana, would reach out to the, to the tax authority in Caymans and say, please send us all the information you have on the holdings of this citizen of our country right. and then that information would come back to the Ghanaian Revenue Authority and then the authority could then tax their citizen depending on tax laws, tax rates, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it's supposed to work. <clears throat> but is that the way it works? Well, what happens in a lot of cases is that there isn't a reciprocal agreement between, again, in this, and I don't know if this is an, an accurate representation. I'm just using these countries as an example. Sure, sure. But a lot of times, a developing country will not have an agreement with a tax haven or a developed country government 
to exchange the information. So it takes time to negotiate those reciprocal agreements. Mm -hmm. If I, in Ghana, want information from you in Caymans, you agree to give it to me. If you in Caymans want information from me in Ghana, I agree to, to give it to you. It takes a long time to sort of um, uh, create those types of agreements. Um, a lot of uh, developing country revenue authorities don't have the capacity to do those types of agreements. They just don't have the, the people um, right. to be able to do those types of things. So while the, while the process is good and well-intentioned, right. it's going to take some time before it's really working to, a, to its fullest potential. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, would, I would argue that it should be an automatic <coughs> you have to do an individual agreement and um, uh, uh, it should be much easier for the developing right. country to get this information. Right. Um, as long as you can prove that the owner of an account is your citizen, that should be sufficient, uh, sh sufficient proof that they could give you the information. Right. Um, and this is, I should also say, this is very early days. It's only mm -hmm. gone into, um, it's only begun operating re within the last year or two. So it's a very new process. Right. Uh, I think uh, over time, it will improve, it will become easier, and it will become uh, very useful. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. For in respect to developed countries, right? Some of them, uh, we have noticed, uh, because I was going to ask you a specific question down the road concerning uh, your own opinion or the opinion of your organization with respect to the CPI and uh, the, um, uh, the secrecy uh, financial index, right? But we're going to get to that. But before we mm -hmm. do, I wanted to know from you, I mean, what's your opinion on that concerning the fact that developed countries are actually they themselves enabling, you know, the opacity of this tax seven that they have on shore, right? Does your organization addresses that? I mean, the, uh, address that, I'm sorry. Well, we do in the context of supporting our own, in the, in the US, our own legislation to eliminate anonymous shell companies. I mean, that, right. that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a key part of our work, Right. is trying mm -hmm. to get that law uh, or get that bill uh, yes. signed, yeah. signed into law. That's right. So, I mean, that's a, that's a key indication that we recognize as an organization that the uh, very lax uh, corporate uh, incorporation laws are very weak in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and need to be strengthened, need to be fixed. The process has to be um, uh, completely changed so that uh, you can't have an anonymous company. So, yeah, we recognize very clearly uh, what the U.S. role is in facilitating illicit money from outside the country. All right, All right. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, the, you know, I see that even the United States, even developed countries, what I've noticed for the last, uh, 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 for the last 20 years, since I studied international taxation uh, in law school, I came to discover that even the United States, all these developing countries are incapable of repatriating funds that multinational companies located in various, uh, in all these countries uh, are taking out. Why, why is that? Uh, are you referring to uh, a tax avoidance? Yes, I'm referring to the, to the tax because the process, uh, one of the reasons why they're using um, tax havens for with respect to a multinational corporation, right, is to commit the tax avoidance that is legal, whether it's aggressive or not, right? right. Now, why is it difficult for tax authorities within the OECD countries? Is it difficult to bring or to convince companies to repatriate these funds or to stop them because they are clearly committing? Like I said, my position is. I don't see where the limit is between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Yeah. People will say, well, the law is the law, but who created the law? It's not we the people. I don't know about you, but or everybody else, but I didn't create that law. 
I didn't call my senator or my congressman or woman to vote or to sign this specific law. Right. Right. So for me, now as a specialist of this issue, I think that uh, there is, I mean, th there is an underlining issue of corruption within those who are getting paid, I mean, those who are paying, those who are supposed to write the law or writing the law for our lawmakers, you know? I know you are not a specialist of uh, uh, fiscal policy or anything, but what's your opinion on the fact that we have this lobby industry literally writing laws for our lawmakers? Yeah, it's a, it's a particularly uh, tough problem in the US. Um, tax law, environmental regulations, um, uh, employment law, uh, there's so many aspects of business that are impacted, influenced by the companies or the industries themselves. They can give so much money to candidates for their campaigns that once those people are elected, it's very difficult for them to then turn around to the people who gave them enough money to get elected and say, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to help you. So that's, it's, it, it, at least in the U.S., it gets down to how you finance a public political campaign. The law in the U.S. is that companies are like individuals and have a freedom of speech and can spend their money within limits however they want. Uh, and so you're right. Uh, there's, there's an incredible amount of influence companies and industries have on lawmakers who are making laws Related to, uh, related to tax, and and it's uh, it's it continues to be a problem. Has been a problem for decades. Um, it comes down to uh, several things. One is, can you change the law? Uh, can you change how campaigns are financed? That's Citi a very Citizen United. I'm so much against that precedent that you cannot believe. That's right. That yeah. was a Supreme Court decision uh, of a few years ago where the yeah. Supreme Court in the U.S. said companies should be treated as individuals when it yeah. comes to freedom of speech. And what that means is they can spend their money on public political campaigns. That decision was so bad. Uh, that was a real game changer. Yeah, um, it was so bad. Yeah, I, uh, I, from, a, from a personal point of view, I completely agree with that. It was yeah. a horrible decision uh, because it does open up so many politicians to a uh, tremendous amount of pressure to write laws beneficial only to companies. Uh, and tax law is certainly one of the many ways that can come about. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Have you seen any multinational that you know of or that your organization uh, knows of that has taken any steps to in in the sense of corporate social responsibility to address those issues to become some some kind of a leader in this arena yeah there's um from what i understand vodafone has done some important work in this area there's also a group called the b team b is for business right uh very wealthy individuals have created a nonprofit. Uh, in New York, um, probably the most well-known is Richard Branson, who owns the Virgin Companies. Right. Um, uh, they are promoting a series of um, corporate social responsibility positions and are trying to get companies to abide by those um, opinions. Um, there's also something in the U.S. called the, uh, hopefully I get the name correct, I believe it's the Corporate Roundtable. Okay. Uh, there's close to 200 companies that are part of it. Um, they just last fall uh, signed a document that said uh, companies are obliged to take into consideration not only the interest of their shareholders, mm -hmm. but also the interest of their stakeholders. And what right. that means is the people who live in the communities where they operate, their own employees, 
Um, the idea is that they have to be paid a fair wage. They have yeah. to be provided with health care. Um, the companies have to pay their fair share of tax uh, because they, at least the uh, way this document was written, um, mm -hmm. they understand uh, that it's broader than just making money for their investors. Uh, mm -hmm. They are a part of the social contract, part of the community, uh, and need to operate in a, uh, operate their businesses in a fair and equitable manner. Right, right, right. Now, before we get to the last issue uh, of uh, transnational crimes, uh, I wanted to ask you your opinion on the fact that what do you think of uh, the, uh, I think it was, um, um, uh, not Norway, the Danish, the Danish decision of within the context of helping companies in the COVID-19 uh, struggle to deny, to provide help to corporations that are not paying their taxes within their own jurisdiction. What do you think of uh, that position? Yeah, it's a terrific decision to make. Uh, if a company doesn't pay tax where their headquarters is, there's no reason that government should give them any sort of financial support in difficult times. Uh, essentially, what, um, what the Danish government and other governments have said since then, mm -hmm. I know Canada, I believe the first relief bill, the CARES Act that the U.S. passed, had a similar provision. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what those provisions are saying is that there can't be a situation uh, in the corporate world where um, uh, the upside of business is for private gain and the downside of business is for public responsibility. And by that, I mean, when times are good, the company benefits, doesn't pay taxes into the system, and they're the sole beneficiary. Well, in bad times, the companies look to the taxpayer right. to help bail them out. Right. Uh, and what Denmark and Canada and other governments have said is that's not going to work. And we are not going to support that type of thinking. And I think it was a tremendous decision to make by those lawmakers to refuse bailout money to companies that don't pay tax or are based or technically um, technically operating out of a tax haven. Right, 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 right. Now, let's uh, talk about transnational crimes, right? Transnational criminal uh, network, I mean, the impact within um, illicit financial flow. Yeah. Well, first of all, for the, for the audience, what, I mean, how is transnational fire, uh, crime uh, being defined by the organization? Well, there's not one uh, set definition. Transnational right. crime could have a dozen or more examples. So for right. instance, it can be the trafficking of uh, people, it could be the trafficking of drugs, it could be right. the trafficking of weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be counterfeiting of goods. Right. Uh, so uh, medicines or handbags, say, or sunglasses, mm -hmm. some very simple products some food products that aren't made by the actual manufacturer. So the packaging can look legitimate. It can look like a branded type of, let's say, infant formula, when actually it wasn't made by the company that's on the label. Uh, it could be harmful to children who use it. Uh, that's an example of counterfeiting. Um, everybody is familiar with knockoff sunglasses, knockoff watches. Right. watches yeah. Um, uh, or it could also be the sale of legitimate goods, mm -hmm. products, um, timber, fish, various minerals, gold, silver, copper, uh, mm -hmm. that were illegally mined or fished or cut down. Legal mm -hmm. mining people have heard of, blood diamonds people have heard of, yeah. um, um, uh, illegal timber uh, uh, cutting, clear cutting of forests. Um, these are massive, massive businesses, billions of year, dollars a year 
um, just in any one of those sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's uh, it, um, transnational crime can, can be a whole host of different things, but mm -hmm. essentially it's a $2 trillion a year business, if you want to look at it as an industry, a yeah. list of trafficking in goods, one type or another. It's yeah. a $2 trillion a year business. That's, That's a lot of money. Massive. It's massive. Right. So what you have to think of when you hear that amount mm -hmm. is this is, uh, these are proceeds that uh, governments are collecting tax on. Mm -hmm. um, these are industries in which the workers are not being paid a fair wage. They're not mm -hmm. getting any sort of health benefits. Um, and it's, you started the conversation off with the word greed, and this is mm -hmm. exactly what this is all about. All about it's right. an illegal way to make money, and it comes down to greed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, 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 Tom, let me ask you this. Um, in terms of, you know, if someone was to ask you, what is, you know, we have defined, you know, pretty clearly the entire illicit financial flow, uh, flows component, right? Now, in terms of impact within this illicit financial flow, which, which one, you know, uh, bribery, corruption, tax evasion, uh, transnational crimes, uh, trade misinvoicing, which one is the most impactful in terms of percentage? Oh, well, let's, uh, let's see. <clears throat> um, well, we just said transnational crime is about $2 trillion a year. Right. Um, trade misinvoicing is a little under a trillion a year, right? Um, tax evasion uh, by multinationals is probably a similar amount, probably right. about a trillion a year or so. Right. Um, so uh, transnational crime as as a group of crimes, right? Yes. Illicit narcotics, illicit drugs, human trafficking, and then all those counterfeiting. Uh, all taken together are probably right. the largest um, individual types of transnational crime would be smaller, of course. Right. Um, but uh, that would be the that would be the general look at at, at the size of these problems. Now, right. that that to say that, for instance, um, trade misinvoicing is about eight hundred billion to a trillion a year. Now, now that's not the loss to the government. Right. Uh, it would be a subset of that. The tax loss would be less. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with transnational, or sorry, same thing would be with um, uh, tax evasion mm -hmm. by corporations. Uh, the amount of money moved is maybe a trillion. The tax loss, maybe 200 billion. Mm -hmm. um, still significant, not to, not to diminish uh, the severity of the problem, but right. just to be a little bit more clear about how much these governments may be losing collectively. Right. I guess what I was also trying to get from you is how, I mean, how much impactful is the corruption committed by kleptocrats within the definition of uh, illicit financial flow? In other words, is it uh, about 5% or less or more, you know, it's um, it's hard to put a number on uh, corruption by kleptocrats. Right. Uh, <clears throat> it's so hard to determine. <coughs> Excuse right. me. Um, yeah. It's probably the smallest yeah. of all the illicit flows, mm -hmm. but it has its own sinister impact Correct. on societies. Correct. Because Correct. if you have massive corruption at the top of governments. Everybody within government knows that's taking place and they all take their little piece. They mm -hmm. all have the opportunity to be corrupt in small ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the person in the customs department uh, taking a bribe, the, the police officer taking a bribe to not give you a, a speeding ticket, whatever it may be, it creates a situation at the top of government that flows down through the rest of the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, that basically undermines democracy. 
Mm -hmm. It undercuts the social contract between government and the governed uh, and creates a, a society that's rots from within. Right. So while the numbers may be relatively small compared to some of these other movements of illicit money, mm -hmm. it has its own very corrosive impact on countries. Mm, perfect. Now, so for a final uh, uh, discussion, I mean, uh, I wanted to have your personal thought on the following. Um, what, I mean, do you think, uh, do you think that the, the, the world will be able to achieve uh, goal 16 by 2030? I think it's going to be very difficult. Right. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to achieve any of the goals. Right. Uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have the goals there. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't have the targets in place. And it doesn't mean that governments shouldn't strive to achieve the targets and the goals. Right. It should be ambitious. Right. It should be far-reaching. And right. when they were originally passed or adopted uh, in 2015, there were a lot of naysayers saying, this will never happen. It's going to be a waste of time, so on and so forth. I don't agree with that at all. I think unless you reach high, you never achieve anything high. I think that's true. Uh, so even if a lot of these countries only get halfway to their target or halfway mm -hmm. to their goal, that's better than they were at the beginning. Right. Uh, and you have to applaud progress wherever you see it. See. You have to help countries, governments, peoples achieve things they demonstrate a desire to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, that's the overriding principle of what the SDGs are all about. It's about striving that. for something big. Right. Uh, and and I, I would fully support um, uh, the, the reach right. that the SDGs are trying to achieve. And while every government is not going to achieve them, some will. Some will get partly the way there and they'll all be better off for it. Tom, I thank you so much for accepting to participate to this conversation. It was, it was wonderful, it was an honor, because you are honoring me by being my first, ah, first true. official wonderful guest. And I feel I, honored. <laughs> I had to have you. <laughs> well, thank oh, you so I much. had to have Raymond, because your organization is such a key to, I'm writing a book, I told you that, it is in progress. Uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to finish it soon. But uh, everything I'm writing, I'm basing my information from, I mean, I'm taking this information from your organization. So thank you so much for participating. Well, that's terrific. Well, thank you again. And uh, the best of luck to you and your podcast and your book as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.